John is a native of Dripping Springs, Texas, and has served as uh, the preacher for that congregation uh, on a full-time basis since May of 2001. Uh, he preached there uh, before that uh, on more of a part-time basis as he uh, worked uh, for the uh, and with the Southwest School of Biblical Studies in Austin on a full-time basis and then has kind of swapped that. Now he's still with Southwest but only on a part-time basis and is now more full-time uh, with the Dripping Springs congregation. Many of you may know uh, John's face uh, from uh, the Searching for Truth uh, DVD that was uh, produced by the World Video Bible School out of Maxwell, Texas. John is the principal speaker and narrator uh, on that uh, very valuable teaching tool. I know members of this congregation have handed out multiplied hundreds of those uh, since they were created. Uh, we have a couple of members here uh, who were converted in part, John, due to that, uh, that DVD. And it's a great teaching tool. Uh, we have free ones <laughs> periodically uh, as you go through the building you'll see racks where you'll find those and if you haven't seen that I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's a great uh, teaching tool and an opportunity to share the gospel with someone uh, in a very uh, unique way. Uh, John's wife Carla uh, is here with him and we're thankful for that. They have uh, three sons. And uh, I've been looking forward to being able to see John again and to hear him speak. I know we are in for a treat this morning as he addresses the subject, the heart of the gospel. Brother John. Eddie, thank you. It is certainly a joy to be with this congregation, to be able to be with members of the school here and the student body fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and friends, what a blessed privilege it is to be able to talk about the gospel, to be able to sing to God and to praise Him, and to spend time this week in a study of His eternal Word, and we praise Him and give Him the glory that is so richly deserving to our Heavenly Father. Privilege today also to be accompanied by my son, Jacob, and uh, his girlfriend, Alyssa Beam, and her parents. Greg and Tina Beam, glad that they're here today, and other friends of ours that we've known from other places that have gathered here on this occasion. Before us this morning is a very interesting looking baptistry. I saw this baptistry a number of years ago and traveling in the Bible lands just south of the area of Basra and Arad in the southeastern corner of the land of Israel. And in this old Byzantine church building, the builders made this baptistry, I think, very appropriately so, in the shape of a cross. I think they understood something that all of us need to understand. And that is when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and we are immersed into that watery grave of baptism, that we are being buried with Christ in death. According to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6, we're buried with him by baptism into death. If we leave out the cross of Christ in our preaching and teaching what a person needs to do to be saved, then we have left out the heart and the core and the soul of the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes, that is the gospel, and is baptized shall be saved. As we think about that gospel this morning, that good news, we need to contemplate and consider why it is good news. And as we do so, I'd like us to go back to Psalm 19 and verse number 1. Well, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Indeed, as we look at this marvelous creation, it is God's braille to a blind humanity. We learn about the glory of God and His greatness just in terms of His power and His design and know that we serve a marvelous Creator. We stand in awe of this marvelous creation, even our own human bodies, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And yet, just by examining the natural world, I cannot know about the love of God and the greatness of God and the true essence of His glory. For the psalmist goes on to say in verse number 6 that it is through the law of the Lord that we come to an understanding, that we are made wise, that our souls are converted, that we indeed are enlightened with truth. And brethren, I get excited when I think about what the Bible reveals to us about the gospel message. And what a blessed privilege it is for me today to be able to talk about that. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. But he also declared in that verse that it wasn't that He was doing it for His own glory, but for the glory of God. Not of our own glory, but to bring glory to God. And when we preach and when we teach and when we share with others the good news, what we're really pointing them to is the righteousness, the glory, and the goodness of God. Yes, the glory of God has to do with the radiance that emanates from the throne of God. Because God is perfect and holy in every way. He is all-powerful. Have you ever looked at the sun? Have you ever stopped to consider that you can't look at it very long? Young people, look at the sun for just a moment, and you have to turn away. Why? Because of the tremendous amount of energy that emanates from that source of power, that source of energy. And in a similar way, the Bible describes the brilliance of what is around God's throne, not the throne itself, just the brilliance that radiates from the throne of God. So powerful, so great, that it causes men to bow in humble submission. That it caused Moses, when he saw just the tail end of the glory of God on Mount Sinai, to have to be covered in the cleft of the rock by God's hand. And even when he came down from the mountain, do you remember? He had to put a veil over his face because the people were afraid to look upon Moses because his face did shine. And so this veil was over him so he could speak to them. When we're in the presence of God and we see the glory of God, it will bring us to our knees. I am afraid that as a preacher, I sometimes fail in truly, adequately representing and communicating that great message. We need to spend time in the text and spend time really digging deeper into this message of what we are calling this morning the heart of the gospel. Yes, the firmament shows the glory of God, but the word of God indeed is that which helps us to better understand what the gospel is all about. Paul said in Romans 1.16, it is that which saves us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul spoke of it as a glorious gospel. And then, in great passages of Scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not as though baptism wasn't essential, as we'll talk about a little later on at the end of our lesson. But the primary emphasis is upon the cross of Christ that leads people to the watery grave of baptism to be baptized into the death of our Lord and Savior. What a glorious gospel it is. Life and immortality are brought through the gospel, Paul said to Timothy. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, verse 23. John the baptizer was preparing the way, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. This gospel is indeed beautiful. And as we reflect upon the gospel of Jesus and what it really means, in my mind, yes, as we start off with 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, where Paul speaks about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, when he says, I've declared unto you the gospel wherein you are saved, or by which you are saved and wherein you stand, if you keep in memory how that Christ died, He was buried, and He was resurrected again the third day according to the Scriptures. At the core of the Gospel lies the death of Christ. Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus was crucified for your sins and for mine. 
But as I grow in my faith and as I seek to understand more about God and who He is and why He died for me and why that had to happen, I have come to, over the years, appreciated more the epistle to the Romans. Maybe sometimes we could even describe it as the gospel according to Paul. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote to help us better understand the nature of this message that we call the gospel. And friends, if you want to get close to God, if you want to get into the heart of God, if you want to, as we sometimes sing the song, into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, seeking to know the reason why He should love me so, then study Romans. Because in Romans chapter 1, when Paul, who wanted to go to Rome and to go to Spain, wrote this letter encouraging brethren, helping them to better understand the nature of this message that we preach, he said in verse number 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. I want to go up there and have some fruit among you. I want to see people come to Christ. I want to see people know the Lord. I want to preach the gospel to you. Why? I'm not ashamed of it. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why, Paul? Because in verse 17, now listen to it. He says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness, against those that would commit ungodliness or unrighteousness. Paul, in many ways, captures and summarizes the essence of what he will expand upon in greater detail in this great gospel message throughout the book of Romans. We learn that it is God's power, His dynamite unto salvation. It's the means by which we come to know what we need to know and to learn about the grace and the goodness and the mercy of Almighty God. Why did he preach the gospel? Look at verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Have you ever thought about that word righteousness, young people? It's one of those words sometimes that we just throw around or maybe we quote it in a passage of Scripture like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Maybe sing about it. And yet as we study throughout the sacred text about that word righteousness, we come to better understand that it had everything to do with that which was a high standard of integrity or morality or the goodness or the highest of life's ideals in any particular culture but especially as then actualized and completely known in Jesus Christ and in the message of God's word for as the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verse 172 all your commandments are righteousness therein is the righteousness of God revealed Folks, too many times when it comes to converting people, we've tried to convince them about the necessity of baptism for salvation, and rightly so, but we have divorced ourselves from the very nature of the cross, and that should be a shame and a blight upon us, because when we do, we are failing to give God the proper glory at what happened at Calvary. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. If we want to lead people to the watery grave of baptism, if we want to encourage them to live a life of godliness and holiness, they need to see God. They need to understand more of who God is. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What are we talking about when we talk about the righteousness of God? This gospel plan of salvation that God had in His mind from the very beginning of time to save sinful humanity that involved the coming of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, as prophesied about in Old Testament scriptures, and finally then came to fruition at the beginning of this new era, the first century, this era of the messianic prophecies that had been made, this Christian system that is now in existence, made possible by Jesus' cross, reveals to us that God is all-knowing, Psalm 139, that God is omnipresent, Psalm 139, that God is loving. God is love, 1 John 4 and verse 8. And then this, God is completely and utterly holy, perfect in every way. To better understand the cross, we have to understand the nature of God. To better understand what took place at Calvary, 
and why it is that we need to respond to heaven's invitation and to know that we can't of ourselves and in and of ourselves save ourselves by ourselves, that we have to have the blood of Jesus is to know something then about who God is. Habakkuk tells us a little bit about this in Habakkuk 1, 12 through 13. God, you are of pure eyes and even to look upon sin, to even look upon iniquity, wrongdoing. And so in the context of that great book, why, God, are all these bad things allowed to go on? We know the very nature of who you are. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse number 2, we read that there is none perfect or holy God than you. And in thinking about what Isaiah saw in the throne room scene of Isaiah chapter 6, as he was promoted, to, as he was encouraged and provoked to go preach the gospel, to go and preach the message of truth, the good news that would, yes, cause some hearts to be hardened because they would reject God, but others to be saved. You know what it was that encouraged him? You know what it was that motivated him to want to share the good news and to go preach? He saw God as the train, the tip of God's robe just filled the temple. The earth shook. And the wing-like creatures in that temple complex were saying, holy, holy, holy. These seraphim who were in God's presence had to cover themselves with their wings. They covered themselves with their feet, their body. They flew around saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And you know what Isaiah said when he saw that? Woe is me. I am a man undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. You see, we have to understand the nature of who God is, that He is perfect in every way, and because He is completely and utterly holy, that He cannot have anything to do with sin. It's not that His hand is so short that He cannot save, or His ear heavy that He cannot hear. But Isaiah said, it is our iniquities that have separated us from God. And our sins have caused him to hide his face from us. How is God going to overlook that? How is God just going to turn a deaf ear to unrighteousness and unholiness? Because we, at some level, can understand this. We would cry out in horror, asking for justice if we were to see child being abused, an elderly woman or man being taken advantage of. We cry out and we say, where's the justice? Adolf Hitler, who was responsible for the killing of millions of Jewish people and Polish people, is that to go unpunished? Is God just to turn a, a deaf ear to that, a blind eye? He cannot. God cannot do that. He cannot ignore wrongdoing. And yet what the Bible teaches us is that not only is God holy and cannot ignore wrongdoing, He is also just. He is perfect in every way. And as we think about Romans 3 and verse number 11, that there is no respect of persons with God. Is God going to somehow overlook our sins of lying, our sin of anger, our sin, is that any more unjust and horrible to look upon by God than other things that other people have done throughout their lifetime? If God is perfect in every way, then all sin is a terrible thing in His sight. He's just. Which of us is better than the next? Not one of us. All, Paul says in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. That's me. That's you. Individuals outside of this building this morning, 
people all over the world. God is holy. He is just. All of us are sinners. And yet something else we read in God's Word is though He is full of mercy. He is rich in it. He is is willing to withhold punishment. But now we've got a problem. We've got a dichotomy, don't we? How is it that if God is utterly and completely holy and cannot ignore sin, and yet He is also rich in mercy, He is also just, and how will He therefore be the justifier of men? He cannot ignore all of this. He has to do something about it. And yet that's what Paul develops in the book of Romans to help us better understand the nature of God's grace and how he worked this out so that he could be both just, that is, in punished wrongdoing, and the justifier of men. Declare them not guilty. How did he do it? He did it at Calvary. He did it at the cross. There is God's glory. There is God's goodness revealed. Because he came to this earth and inhabited a human body and dwelt among men. He took up his abode among men. He lived among us. And he was in all points tempted like we are. Yet he did it without sin. He came, emptied himself, not of his deity, but of all the privileges and rights that went along with deity. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Why? Because Jesus died for all. Jesus took our place at Calvary. We received his, the stripes that we should have received. He received them, Isaiah chapter 53. We should have been the ones that hung upon that cross. We were guilty and are of unrighteousness and ungodliness. But Jesus said, I'll die for you. I'll take your place so that I might satisfy the justice of God so that he can be declared righteous. He's not ignoring sin. He's not ignoring wrongdoing. He is going to punish the wicked. And yet he's going to save those who by faith receive the goodness and the mercy of God when we complete or comply with His will. Brethren, there's a beautiful message that we need to explore more deeply. God wanted us to understand what took place when we speak about the heart of the gospel and the nature of it. And so in the book of Romans, turn over to Romans chapter 3, you will see that not only does Paul describe to us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God worked out a plan, and He wanted you to know about the depth of this. He wanted you to see it from different angles. He wanted all of us to understand His glory and His greatness. And so what did He do? In Romans chapter 3 and in Romans chapter 5, He uses four words to help us better understand what took place at the cross. There is justification, the language of the courtroom. There is propitiation, the language of the temple. There is redemption, the language of the marketplace. And there is reconciliation, the language of the home. Do we realize what took place at Calvary? Justification, declaring us not guilty. You and I deserve de- earned and deserve death, but God said, I'm going to declare you not guilty. What good news that would be to some person standing before a a magistrate knowing that they were guilty of some crime. Going to have to go to the death chamber. On death row. And someone says, I'll take your place. I'll die for you so that you don't have to die. So that you don't have to suffer the penalty of sin. Sin is terrible. It destroys, it maims, it separates us from God. God can't ignore it. And so, going all the way back to the Old Testament, He taught His people about how terrible sin was and that as a result of sin, things have to die. Terrible consequences result from the breaking of God's law. 
He wanted them to know that, so one by one, these animals were brought to the temple. A constant flow of blood, some writers say, came from the temple complex as these animals, one by one, were killed and sacrificed to atone for their sins. God wanted them to know this is serious. He can't ignore wrongdoing. Something has to happen. Punishment has to be received. And so these animals were offered in prospect of a better day in which Jesus, the Son of God, would come as the perfect sacrifice and die for sinful humanity. At the heart of the gospel, my friends, is the problem that sin brings to a terrible world. At the heart of the gospel is the problem of sin for humanity. It separates us from God, but in the process of justification, God says, I am declaring myself righteous and good by not ignoring sin. I'm punishing it. How? I'm going to receive your stripes. I'm going to die for you so that I can declare you not guilty. Not only is justification in view in the heart of the gospel, but there is the idea of propitiation. Not only the appeasing of God's wrath, wrath, but the satisfying of justice. As you begin to examine that word, propitiation, found at least five times in the Greek form of it in the New Testament, you will see that in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9, verse 5, that there it gets translated as mercy seat. You ever thought about that? Mercy seat. What's the mercy seat? What took place on the mercy seat? The mercy seat were the wing-like cherubims over the Ark of the Covenant that rested in the Holy of Holies. What was in the covenant? What was in that Ark? The Ten Commandments. Representative of God's law that condemned humanity. Those sins that were committed by humanity. The laws that they broke as represented in the Ten Commandments that were in the ark were covered over by God. With these wing-like creatures, the cherubim called His mercy seat. The word mercy carries with it the idea of the withholding of punishment. We earned and deserved it. But God withheld it. God covered over it. And a similar word found that is used for the word atonement in the Old Testament. Going back to Genesis 6.14, Noah even put pitch that covered over the ark to cover it over. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty ashamed about some things that I've done in the past. Things I've said, things that I've done, and I want them to be covered over. I want them to be forgotten. God does that. He can cover over our unrighteousness so that we can have a sense of renewal and hope and zeal and optimism about tomorrow. Because if there's one thing that the Bible does for me, it reveals to me my weaknesses and my sin. And I say, God, therefore be merciful unto me, a sinner, just like that man did who went to the temple. Unlike the Pharisee who prided himself in how great he was, justifying himself, the sinner, he was justified because he humbled himself before God and he recognized his sinfulness and God's greatness, and knew that it was God that could save him. And so in the idea of the cross and the heart of the gospel is not only justification and propitiation, but the idea of redemption, the language of the marketplace, buying and selling, having its root meaning in an Old Testament word, the goel, the avenger of blood, translated oftentimes as the redeemer in books like the book of Ruth, Boaz acted as the near kinsman, the redeemer, who purchased the property for Ruth, keeping it in Naomi's family. It was about to be let go. Someone else had renting it, and now she was about to lose it. And what did he do? He paid the price so that she could keep it. Abraham, 
when Lot was carried away by an avenger, foreign nations, carried away into captivity. Who was it that went and rescued Lot? Abraham, the Bible says, acted as a redeemer. He brought him back from his slavery, from those that held him captive. He rescued him. And so you can see in a similar way what took place at the cross because we were held captive by Satan, by sin. But God wanted to rescue us, to redeem us, to purchase us. Reminds me a whole lot of the book of Hosea. For in the last chapter of that book, Hosea uses the word redeemer to refer to what God does. This picture of this woman, Gomer, who is a prostitute that Hosea has to marry. And what does she do? In chapter 2, she leaves her husband. And all the while she's left her husband, she's enjoying all fine food and all the delicacies of life at her disposal. But what she doesn't realize is that all along while she's receiving these delicacies, it's not her lovers that are giving it to her. It's actually Hosea and God. And then they're through with her. Her life is cheapened by the standard of men. And in her wretched condition, in her abused body, she's put up on the auction block. Who wants her now? After all these men have had her. Who wants her? Who would dare purchase her? picture is that of Israel. Israel that had gone off whoring after other nations who had repeatedly turned their back upon God. The northern ten nations, yes, to go into captivity, never to return again, but God's love for Judah and keeping His plan alive provided a means and a ways for them to be preserved. It was God that reached down to sinful humanity and said, I want you. I'll purchase you. I don't care what kind of condition you're in. I don't care what's happened to you in your life. I don't care about the terrible things of your past. And I've talked to a lot of people who had done some terrible things and who have a great deal of remorse over those things. And they don't feel like their life is worth much. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you've questioned and said, could God ever love me? I talked to a man a number of years ago when I was in campus ministry, he came to my office and tears coming down his cheek. He said, John, I'm so embarrassed to even tell you about things that I've done. Things that are not polite at all to talk about. And I'm so embarrassed. I'm so filled with guilt. My life has been cheapened. I said, no, it's not. God cares for you. He wants you. Maybe nobody else wants you. And sometimes, maybe in a marriage situation when there is a man that goes away and gets involved in an adulterous relationship, a woman is left behind feeling abandoned as though they're not wanted. Let me tell you something. God wants you. He wants all of us. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We ought to be going out into the highways and the byways preaching and teaching to those people who are lying in the gutters, to those people who are sick with sin and helping them to understand that God wants them. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Luke's gospel to the so-called outcast. Came Jesus said to preach the gospel to the poor, to the broken hearted. To help those who are blind to the recovering of their sight. Those who are maimed. Unwanted. As you go through the book of Luke, like the tax collector, the publican. Like the prostitute of Luke chapter 7. God wants us. He redeemed us at Calvary. And because of that, We can come back home. We went away from home. But in the idea and the language of reconciliation is this warm reminder that while we became an enemy of God, while we turned our back upon Him, 
God is wooing us. God is encouraging us. God is calling us home to be reunited, to be made one with Him. For if when we were enemies, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, For if when we were enemies, Christ died for us, reconciling us to God. Who is going to die for a righteous man? Some might. For a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. By whom, he says, we have now received the reconciliation. For, among other words that we could be looking at, that all speak of the grace of and the mercy of God, and what took place at Calvary. The core of the gospel, the message of the gospel, the heart of the gospel is the sinfulness of man, the righteousness of God, and the debt that was paid at Calvary for our sins, that Jesus died for a sinful humanity to satisfy the justice of God so that He might be both just and the justifier of men. Praise be to Him for that and for His unspeakable gift. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul reveals much about that. What is our response to it? As we conclude and we think about the suffering that went on at Calvary, we are reminded of the terribleness of sin. Why did Jesus have to die in the way that He did? Couldn't they have just executed Him in some other way? God, couldn't you have worked out some other plan? Because God wanted us to be reminded that when we see Calvary and we see that lictor bringing back his whip upon our Savior's back and opening up his back and those bruised and bleeding body of his that ultimately came to be hung on Calvary as he pushed himself upon that nail to exhale that air to relax those diaphragm muscles and then back down again after a while you have to push up on that nail to exhale. It was a death by suffocation. Why the excruciating pain? Why the horribleness of that tragic event? Why the mutilated body? Why so much blood loss? Why was it so terrible? Because sin is terrible. Because Jesus was taking upon Himself the stripes that all of sinful humanity deserves. For the rapist, the murderer, the thief, for the one who has killed millions of people, it's been terrible what's happened at the hands of lawless men. When we look at Calvary, we ought to be reminded of the sinfulness of this world and the love of God that would say, I'll die. Who's going to die for a righteous man? Well, some might. A just man, yes. But who's going to die for the thief? Who's going to die for the child molester? Who's going to die for those who commit all types of heinous crimes? Jesus said, I'll do it. I'll go to Calvary's cross. And there he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It's the greatest story ever told. I can't even get my mind around it all. To understand what took place there for me. What's my response? What's my response to this cruelty that I should have deserved or that I should have received that I fully deserve? I participate in what he participated in in a similar fashion. For Paul goes on to say, and then in Romans 6, in verse 17. That God be thanked, whereas you were once servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Paul says you were once servants of sin, slaves to it. But you obeyed, notice, from the heart. The form of doctrine, not the doctrine. They themselves didn't go out and be crucified on a cross and buried in the tomb and literally raised again the third day. But they obeyed something like it, he said. Something like it. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine 
that was delivered unto you. We started off with 1 Corinthians 15. This doctrine that was delivered unto you. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. They obeyed something like it. What was it? They themselves died to the old man of sin. They repented after hearing the great message of God and His holiness. They realized their sinfulness. And they said, we cannot save ourselves. We need God to save us. How, God? When we participate in His death. And as he had already said in verse 3 of Romans 6, listen to it now. Know you not that as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see the story of our own faith Baptism comes together in a beautiful way in the message of the gospel. Indeed, we cannot be saved unless we are born again, Jesus said in John 3 through 5. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. No wonder Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes that and is baptized shall be saved. No wonder in Acts chapter 8 when Philip joined himself to the chariot of that Ethiopian nobleman who was reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And the place of the scripture he read was this. He read from Isaiah 53. And the text says that Philip at that same passage, now listen, preached unto him Jesus. You know what the next verse says? They came to a certain water, and the Ethiopians said, Here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? A direct connection between the preaching of the gospel and the conversion process that God created where these two come together in a very beautiful way. You were servants of sin, Paul said, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we go back to the slide that we started off with and think about baptistry in the shape of a cross. Why does it have to be in the shape of a cross? No, but we need to remember That when we're being baptized, it's not the water in and of itself that can save us. We're not baptismal regenerationists that believe there's something magical or mystical in the water, but it's our faith in Christ. It's our faith in the blood of Jesus. We are justified by faith when we respond to the will of God. That is, when we, in the obedient act of baptism, come into contact with the cleansing blood of Christ, we can then be declared not guilty. We can be purchased back from Satan and belong to God. We can have our sins covered over and we can be reunited with God, be His child, be in His family, His church, live and serve Him in all the days of our life as we walk in faith and we trust Him, we can with confidence one day hear our Lord say, well done, now good and faithful servant enter into the joy of our Lord. This morning we invite you to consider heaven's invitation because God is crying out to you saying, I've paid the price. I want you. Why don't you come to God? Come to God. If we can help you in some way, pray with you, for you, encourage you in your walk of faith. Will you come? As together we stand and as we sing.